grab a Bible. We are going through the Gospel of Matthew still. We're getting near the end. Go to Matthew 27. Uh, we are, uh, are going to go through um, verses 1 through 10 this morning. Uh, and as you turn there, if you don't have a Bible, actually, you can grab one on the table over here, a gift to you. You can download a Bible app on your phone, uh, follow along. And as you, as you find your place, just let me uh, really quickly uh, give you a couple of bits of information that we really want to make sure you get, that you probably, uh, if you're like the average West Villager and you don't actually get in here till like 1030, uh, probably missed all the announcements and any other way we've attempted to communicate this to you thus far. Okay, so I got four things. I'm going to hit them real quick. They're sort of all connected. Uh, starting next Sunday, we're going to do like a two-week celebration that we are calling 10 again. Uh, and here, here is why we're calling it 10 again. Because last February, uh, we celebrated our 10th anniversary as a church, and we didn't say a word about it. <laughs> and that was mostly because we were in like full lockdown, and we thought that's like a super lame way to celebrate. So um, we're going we're gonna to celebrate this year, but we want to celebrate 10 again. Like, you know, I don't know if guys do this as much. Uh, if they do, I apologize, ladies. But you know, like ladies when they're like 43 uh, and they just keep having a 40th birthday party over and over again? No, it's not. It's just funny. You just chuckle. Okay. <laughs> it's kind of like that. Like we want to pretend we're younger than we really are. No, we're going to, but we want to have a party. Okay. So here's how this is going to work. There's four things you need to know about this. Next Sunday, January 30th, we're going to take a morning to look back at what God has done over the last 11 years, 10 years, whatever. Uh, and so we're going to just celebrate what he's done, tell some stories. Uh, and it's, it's going to be like just an opportunity to celebrate God's faithfulness to us over the years. Uh, so I encourage you to be here for that. Uh, we got some fun things planned. The following Sunday, February 6th, we are actually going to have like an official, I don't know, like birthday party. We're trying not to be lame about it, but honestly, it's going to be lame. But it's going to be fun. We're going to have fun. We're going to celebrate. Uh, and we're going to take that morning to look ahead at what is next for us as a church. And so <clears throat> we have some some things that God has laid on our heart for, for the upcoming years, months and years ahead. And we want to lay out what some of that stuff is. And so I encourage you to be here on February 6th. And then again, so this is the third thing, again on February 6th, same, same day, that evening we're having our, our church family, what we call our vision and prayer night. It's sort of, it's a mix of like our legal AGM, but we also take that as an opportunity to like set the table for what is to come uh, for the future for us for that year, but we're going to actually spend some time talking about the next several years. And so a couple things connected to that. Uh, the first one is this is also a time where we celebrate that God has brought new uh, people into our church family, like in a formal way. So we have this thing that we do here, it's called church membership, and it's a way of people like covenanting with us together as a church to say like, we're all in. We're all in uh, with Team Jesus, specifically Team Jesus here at West Village. Uh, and, and we want to be a part of what God's doing here for a long time. And so a um, couple things with that. We're going to put, if you could, Ken, just throw those names up on the screen behind me as I'm doing this. That would be great. <clears throat> so there's a list of these names that are out at our um, uh, giving station, giving table there. And you can go see those names. And we put them out for a couple of reasons. One, because we want to celebrate uh, who they are, like what God's doing. But two, also because... Um, we just want to put it forward to you as a church family. So if you are seeing any of those names and you're like, yeah, that guy's like, I don't know about that Adam guy. Like he's, I, I don't know about him. Come and let us know. We, we want to have that conversation, okay? So uh, you can see those names out on the, on the, on the desk. Uh, they're here obviously on the screen. Um, so just let us know. We're going to formally welcome them into membership uh, on, on Sunday at our Vision and Prayer Night, uh, February 6th. The other thing with that is we have like a budget that we're going to go through and some other like finer points of, of uh, vision detail. All that information available out at the giving station for the next two Sundays. It'll all be online as well. Um, so you can grab that there. And then the fourth thing. So first thing, January 30th, look back, February 6th. In the morning, <clears throat> we're going to have a birthday party. February 6th in the evening, we're going to have our vision and prayer night. And then lastly, uh, in conjunction with, uh, with our 10th anniversary, we're going to take up a special offering. Uh, and what we want to do is we want to collect an offering as a church, and we want to put that towards some of the things that God has put on our heart for the upcoming years. And so here's our goal. Our goal is that we, as a church family, would bring in $10,000, and we're going to just put all that money. We have a church planting fund that has... Uh, 
I don't know, off the top of my head, I think it has like twenty-five or thirty thousand dollars in it right now. We're just going to take all that money and put it right in there. So you can get all the information, uh, like, or, sorry, you can give by just going to westvillagechurch.com forward slash give and give directly into the Ten Again Fund, or if you go to the lobby uh, and just tell the teller as you're giving that you want this to go into that special anniversary fund, uh, they will make sure it gets there. Sound good? You got all that? Awesome. Okay. Yeah, it's exciting. Whoever was starting to clap, was that you, Joe? Oh, it was over there. Yeah, that's exciting. Yeah, Jesus has been so good to us. Oh, and I should also say, January 30th, so next Sunday, we're actually going to be celebrating some more baptisms. And so if there's anybody here who wants to get baptized or you're watching and you want to get baptized, uh, let us know and we will help facilitate that process. Talk to your community group leader, whatever the case is. Okay, let's, Bible's on lap, uh, on phone. Let me pray and then we will get to work. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your goodness uh, and your faithfulness to us over the years. Uh, You have been so kind to us. As we come to your word this morning, Uh, Our prayer is that you would speak to us. Our prayer is that our hearts would be open to hear exactly what it is that you have for us. We know that uh, you are a God who speaks. That's why we have your word. Uh, You speak through the power of your Holy Spirit. And so we invite you uh, to speak whatever it is that we need to hear. We um, humbly, cautiously, say that we will listen, we will do our best to obey, but we do want to hear from you, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, amen. Okay, Matthew chapter 27, I'll just get right to work here. I got a lot, like there's a lot to cover, okay, I got a lot of things I want to try and get to, so hopefully uh, hopefully we can do this. So let's just pick up in verse 1 and get going here. So verse tw- uh, chapter 27, verse 1, early in the morning... All the chief priests and the elders uh, of the people made their plans. uh, Sorry, let me try that again. I'm not doing a good job here. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and elders of the people made their plans how to have Jesus executed. Verse 2, so they bound him up, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. So let me just pause here, quickly set up the context. So we're in the last week of the life of Jesus. We've been in the last week of the life of Jesus since... Uh, chapter 20, but now we're really starting to zero in on the final moment. So the last probably four Sundays, we've really only moved the plot line ahead about 12 hours or so. So we go back to the Last Supper. This is the Thursday night of the last week of the life of Jesus. We go to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus is praying to his Father. This is like later in that evening, starting to get into early morning. Then we have uh, the, 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 the temple guards. They come and they arrest Jesus. This is, again, early Friday morning. They bring him, if you remember, two weeks ago to Caiaphas' house. Uh, he's the leader of the, he's the chief priest of the, the Sanhedrin. And they have this mock trial. So now we're early, early uh, in the morning on Friday. We have Peter's story, which is in conjunction with the trial. And now we're moving ahead here where the chief priest and the the, the leaders of the Sanhedrin are going to turn Jesus over to Pilate. So they don't have the authority to have him executed. They just lack that political authority. But they, what they want to do is they want to uh, peg him with a crime that they can then hand over to Pilate and say, now you must do something with him. And so that's kind of what they're, that's what they're concocting here. <clears throat> but I want you to notice something very interesting about what Matthew's doing in these last series of texts, and we'll see it in the, in the weeks to come as well. There's this like a large group of people, swath of people with whom Matthew is trying to show us have been complicit in the death of Jesus. So we have the disciples who deserted Jesus in the garden. We, we have uh, the, the chief priests and the religious leaders. We have Peter. Next week, we're going to see Pilate and the crowds. Today, we're going to see Judas and how he was a part of what Jesus had to go through in terms of going to the cross. And what Matthew is trying to do, and I think it's really important for us to understand this, because a lot of times we can hear these stories and kind of distance ourselves from the characters. I'm so glad I'm not like them. But what Matthew is trying to do is he's trying to show us how Jesus' death on the cross is actually all of our problem. Like every single one of us, in some way, some shape or form, have, have been a participant in the death of Jesus. That you might not be a Peter, you might not be a Judas, but you, you might be a religious leader, or you might be part of the crowd. And the reality is, if we're honest, we're probably a little bit of all of them. But what Matthew wants us to see, and I think this will be very important for us to hear this morning, 
is that all of these characters are given to us to highlight the reality that this is our problem as well. We are the religious leaders. We are the disciples. We are Peter. We are Pilate. We are the crowds. And as we'll see this morning, we are also Judas. You and me, we are Judas. Verse 3, Matthew writes this, When Judas, who had betrayed him, that's Jesus. Let's stop there for a second again. Let me help us understand exactly what is going on. So if you remember back to the garden, Jesus was in the garden. He was praying. He was seeking the will of his Father. It was his desire to, if possible, by the grace of God, not endure the cross in the end. His heavenly Father told him, no, this is the cup you must bear. He humbly submits to that. He becomes obedient to death, even death on a cross. As the Apostle Paul tells us in that moment as he's praying, the temple guards come and uh, Judas comes with them. And we're told by Matthew that Judas comes to Jesus and he betrays him. How does he do it? With a kiss. He comes to uh, to Judas comes to Jesus, his friend, his his mentor, the one who who called him to follow him, to be one of his disciples, the one with whom he had spent the last three plus years with. They had laughed together. They They had spent so much time together, probably cried together. They've had all these intimate moments with one another. And Judas comes to Jesus and he betrays him in the most intimate of ways. He kisses him. And then Jesus is arrested, and this, of course, will eventually culminate with his death on the cross. And the the question that we must ask is why? Why did Judas betray Jesus? There's lots of speculation. If you were to read about this, uh, you you would see all all sorts of theories. Some, some, uh, Some speculate that perhaps Uh, Judas was politically motivated. He he had this political zeal for the nation of Israel, and he thought that Jesus was going to be an overly political Messiah. And when he realized that that was not Jesus' intent, his intent was to come and establish the kingdom of God, but not to overthrow Rome, Judas had him betrayed. That's one theory. Another theory is that, that Judas was just not happy with his standing within the disciples. He didn't like that he wasn't one of Jesus' favored. And so uh, he, he betrayed Jesus because of that. Other theories, uh, you know, s- speculate that perhaps it was because Jesus was, or Judas rather, was greedy. We, we know that he was the keeper of the money. We know that he, he was a thief. He was stealing from Jesus and the disciples. And when he realized that, uh, you know, that Jesus' life was coming to an end, he took the 30 pieces of silver because this was kind of his last attempt to make a few bucks before the whole show ended. And so he was just trying to, like, you know, get an early exit on a good startup, if you will. The honest answer is we we don't really know. We're not really told. The gospel writers don't tell us what motivated Judas to do this to Jesus. But but here is what we do know. We are told some things. Uh, If you go back to John 6, we won't turn there, but if you go back to John 6, uh, Jesus, when speaking with his disciples, he tells them that one of them is akin to Satan. And then John writes parenthetically, that that's Judas that Jesus was talking about. Uh, if you go to Luke chapter 22, uh, Jesus at the Last Supper with his disciples uh, will, tells the disciples that one of them will betray him. And Luke includes in his, uh, his narrative of that story that in that moment, Satan actually entered into Judas. That there was something evil inside of Judas that caused him to do this. Now, now let's just, for a second, unpack this, because I I think this is important for us to understand. Because if we're not careful, here's what we will hear. Judas was a victim of the work of Satan. And that's not what I want you to hear. What we don't have in Judas is this character who, who just loved Jesus and wanted to follow Jesus and wanted to serve Jesus and wanted to give all that he had to Jesus. We are, we are told almost from the beginning when we, whenever we're told anything about Judas, that something was a little off with this guy. Many times in the gospel accounts when Judas is mentioned, actually every time in the gospel accounts when Judas is mentioned, there's always these comments that are given 
on the aside that indicate to us that something was not right with Judas. His motivations were off. His reasons for following Jesus, his reasons for serving Jesus, his reasons for being with the disciples, they weren't pure in motivation. It wasn't because he longed and desired to see Jesus glorified or because he even believed he was the Messiah. At least when I, when I say believe, what I'm talking about is the internal sense of belief. Because what we'll see is he actually gives mental assent to that fact. But here's what we discover about Judas. He didn't love Jesus. And this is the warning for us, friends. We have these parts of our lives that are out of alignment with Jesus. Now, now think about Judas for a second. He gave up a lot in order to follow Jesus. He walked away from his family, probably from his livelihood, probably from his village. But there were some parts of his life that were out of congruence with the way that Jesus was calling his disciples to live. And here's what happened. Don't miss this. Satan took those desires and he had a field day with them. If you can imagine... Uh, Judas's life is like a boat, and he's rowing in a particular direction, and he throws up a sail. Satan was just merely the wind that moved the boat further and faster in the direction that it was already going. See, Judas wasn't a victim of Satan's attack. Here's what Judas was a victim of. The desires of the flesh that he allowed to go unchecked. And when I say desires of the flesh, here's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about desires that you and I have that are out of alignment with the way that God desires his people to live, with the way that Jesus desires his people to live. And and here's what we do, okay, if you're anything like me, uh, we sort of trivialize and minimize those things, right? The prophet Jeremiah talks about the human heart. He says the human heart is deceitful above all things, right? Like we're really good at lying to ourselves, Right? Is that just me? Am I, am I the only one that's really good at that? Like, do you eat super healthy? Yeah, I, I only, like, I eat clean all the time. You know, and then you start to, like, actually do an audit of what a person eats, and it's like, well, like, you know, I grabbed a small handful of this, I did a little bit of that. And we just have this way of, like, deceiving ourselves into thinking that we're something that we're not. And, and more often than not, although this is not always the case, but more often than not, we elevate our status rather than, like, you know, think down about ourselves. And here's what happened to Judas, and this is the warning for us. Those small areas of his life that were out of congruence with the way that Jesus called him to live were the things that Satan went in, grabbed, and used to make him a betrayer. And if you and I are not careful, those little sins, those small things in our lives, Those are things Satan will use. He will use to make you a betrayer. How do do we think addiction happens? Do you think anybody wakes up in the morning and says, today I want to become an alcoholic? I don't think so. Today I want to become addicted to porn. I don't think so. Today I want to become addicted to some sort of drug. I don't think so. It starts with a small thing that goes unchecked, that Satan comes in, starts to use against us, and it becomes a big thing. How does a person become bitter? Like this. How do you become a person that is riddled with unforgiveness? Like this. So what's the remedy? If you have your Bibles, keep your finger in Matthew 27. Go a few pages to the right, Matthew chapter 8. These Verses uh, should be on the screen. Or sorry, I said Matthew. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Here we go. Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 15. Here's what the Apostle Paul writes. And he talks about how do we overcome the desires of the flesh. And I think this is important for us. Here's what he says. He says, therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh. Okay, Flesh are desires that we have that are out of uh, accord or incongruent with the way that God will call us to live. Verse, uh, sorry, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. So don't live like that. Verse 13 For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But, but, if you live by the Spirit, you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. 
Here is what the Apostle Paul is saying. That in order for you to overcome these things in your life, you can't ignore them. You can't trivialize them. You can't pretend they're not there. You have to use honesty, sober assessment. This is why we actually say it's super important to be in community so that people can actually know you and say, hey, I see something in your life that doesn't look awesome. Can we talk about that? But then more than that, here's what has to happen. According to the Apostle Paul, there is this supernatural process that must occur. Right? That's why he says it's by the Spirit. He's using these contrasting terms. Flesh, which means what you can do in your own power. Right? I can overcome this addiction. I don't need any help. I'm strong enough. I, uh, no. No, you're not. Right? That's a lie. It's, gonna, it's a lie that's going to take you down the road that Judas went down. It's not the flesh. It's the Spirit. In other words, it's a supernatural thing that must occur where the Spirit comes in and it, the Spirit, He gives you the power, the ability to, to then take your brokenness. And here's what you have to do. You have to bring it to Jesus. You have to bring it to Jesus to find healing. You have to bring it to Jesus to, 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 to find forgiveness. You have to bring it to Jesus to have the bondage of sin and Satan and evil and the flesh broken. You cannot do it by yourself. How do I know? Because I'm a human, right? I I jokingly say, but it's not really a joke. Sunday church gatherings or any church gatherings are like a giant AA meeting. Hi, my name is Chris and I'm a (laughs) Sinaholic. Some of you are familiar with this. You understand what I'm saying. But this is our reality. And, and here's the lie that we will tell ourselves. But, but I go to church. But I listen to sermons. But I read my Bible. But I listen to the right Bible teachers. I don't listen to wrong Bible teachers. I listen to this teachers in this theological stream. I participate in these activities. Those are all good things. But here's, here's my, my contention. They're insufficient things. I mean, just think about Judas. Walked with Jesus For three and a half years, Judas heard all of Jesus' sermons, every single one of them. And look at where he ended up. What do we need? By the power of the Holy Spirit, we need to take our flesh, our brokenness, our hearts. We need to be stripped bare. We need to be at the feet of Jesus. It's intimacy with Christ that gives us the ability to overcome the misdeeds of the flesh. Why did Judas betray Jesus? Why? Because he had sin in his life that he was unwilling to deal with. And don't miss the irony, friends. Don't miss the irony of what's taking place here. Judas was at the table with Jesus. He betrayed him with a kiss. It's not enough to be near Jesus. It's not enough to be around Jesus. You have to be with him. You have to know him. And he has to know you. So Judas was the one who betrayed. Verse 3, when Judas, who had betrayed him, being Jesus, saw that he was condemned. He was seized with remorse. and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and to the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. Now I want you to imagine this for a second, okay? So Here's Judas. He's walked with Jesus. He's part of this intimate community of friends. He goes down this road of betraying Jesus. He kisses Jesus. Jesus is arrested. He's put on trial. He's condemned by the religious leaders. And he now knows that Jesus is going to be handed over to Pilate. There's a a chance, we don't know this to be true, that he was an outside observer to what was taking place at Caiaphas' house. And when he realized that G, what, what Jesus' fate was to be. I mean, just imagine what that was like. 
Imagine how hard that would have been to be, to be faced with the reality, like the, the gravity, the, the, the intensity of your sin. I did this. This is me. This is because of me. We don't have to wonder what he felt like. We're told. This is what Matthew records, that when he saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse. He he had this overwhelming sense that what he had done was wrong. Now, if you remember from last week, we... We kind of have two parallel stories happening here. We have Jesus who uh, denies, or sorry, we have Peter who denies uh, Jesus. And here we have Judas who betrays Jesus. And it's no coincidence that these two stories uh, are back to back. Matthew's wanting us to to look at the two stories and he's he's wanting us to like uh, juxtapose their their experiences, compare and contrast their, their experiences. Last week, we have Peter denies Christ three times. And we're told at the end of, of chapter 26 that when he, when he realized what had happened, right, when the rooster crowed in Luke's gospel, he makes eye contact with Jesus. His response is he wept bitterly. He wept bitterly. He ran away. But that's not where his story ends. Right? Where, where does Peter's story end? Well, in Luke's gospel, we're told that, that Peter was the first one to run to the tomb after the resurrection of Jesus. At the end of John's gospel, like we talked about last week, John, uh, uh, Peter, rather, was out on the boat. Jesus shows up on the shore. Uh, uh, Peter realizes that it's Jesus on the shore, and he just can't get to Jesus quick enough. He just has to get to Jesus. That's important. There, wh- whatever was happening inside of Peter at the moment that he realized that, that he is the one who, who did what he did to Jesus, his response was this, I've got to get to Jesus. i got to see him. I need to talk to him. I need to ask for forgiveness. I need to make this right. And of course, if you weren't here last week, you can go listen online. But the reality was Jesus received him warmly. Extended an unending amount of grace and love to Peter. But what does Judas do? Well, clearly Judas is upset, right? We're, we're told he's filled with remorse. What does he do? He, he runs to the temple. He, he throws the money back into the temple. He's like, I don't want this money. Right? He knows what he's done is wrong. He, he actually says Jesus is innocent. He, 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 he's able to identify that Jesus was not who Judas said he was, that Jesus was who he actually said he was. Judas knew that Jesus was good. Judas knew that Jesus was loving, kind, compassionate. He wasn't a criminal who deserved death. He knew that. And he's trying to make it right. You can, just, you can just feel in him like the, the, the anguish of what he's done. We'll get to this in just a second, but the, the next verse, he goes so far as to actually commit suicide over his sin. So, so what's the difference? What's the difference between Peter and Judas? For Peter, it was all about Jesus. For Judas, it was all about himself. See, he felt bad. But he couldn't get past the fact that what he had done was so bad. He he couldn't get past the fact that, that there was a God who could actually bear the weight of his sin and he held onto it so tightly. We can see him trying and striving to make it right, but he just couldn't do it. The Apostle Paul he, he, um, he says this in 2 Corinthians, talking about, um, he contrasts two types of sorrow. He, he talks about godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. And here's, here's what he writes. He says, godly sorrow brings repentance, which leads to salvation. And listen, listen, leaves no regret. Who's that? That's Peter. That's that's Peter's experience with his sin. That's Peter's experience with with what we would say the biblical nomenclature would be repentance, right? Changing of mind, renewal of mind, changing of ways, taking my sin, 
bringing it to Jesus. And it changed and transformed Peter. It led to salvation. He had no more regret. No more regret. Peter was faithful to Jesus after being forgiven by Jesus. Now, now make no mistake about it. Peter wasn't perfect. Peter, Peter sinned. Peter still needed to keep coming back to Jesus. But there was this overriding sense in him that the grace of God had washed over his brokenness. And it got to the place where Peter was willing to go to his own cross for the sake of Jesus. He did not deny him ever again. That's repentance. That's godly sorrow. But look at the second half of verse 10. Paul writes, but worldly sorrow brings death. Worldly sorrow brings death. If what Peter experienced was salvation, was repentance, was the forgiveness of sin, Judas experienced something very different. He felt bad. He felt horrible. He felt shame, as we often do when we sin. But he couldn't get to the point where he would actually come to Jesus. And there's a warning here for us, friends. There's a grave warning for us. Because when it comes to the effects of our sin and our brokenness and our inability to live the life that Jesus has called us to live, here's what can often happen. We feel bad. We feel really really bad. Some of you feel really bad right now. You're like, this, I hate this church. This church sucks. This guy makes me feel bad. We feel bad that we got caught. We feel bad about the consequences. We feel bad that we hurt somebody. We feel bad about, you know, having to live in light of the reality of what we've done. And here's what I'll say. I'll actually say, like, those are not the worst things ever. Right? Like that's actually like the Holy Spirit's grace in your life trying to show you that sin is bad. Like God is a better way for you. Jesus desires better for you. But if it ends there, it's insufficient. It lacks the power to one, save you from your sin, and two, heal you and change you. If you're a parent, or you've been a parent, or you have been around a child before, you understand what this is like. Uh, my kids are all old now, but when they were young and they couldn't chirp back to me, now they're just like, oh, whatever, that is a stupid uh, old guy doesn't know what he's talking about, which is mostly true. But when they were young, I could make them do whatever I wanted. It was glorious. Like, it was so great. I would say, do this. They would say, no. I would say, yes. They would say, okay. Usually threats were involved, right? I'm going to take away this. I'm going to ground it, right? But but I could coerce. I could physically, emotionally, mentally, like there was just ways to make them do whatever I wanted. And it was a glorious existence, right? Like feed me grapes. No, then you're grounded for a month. Okay, grapes it is, right? You fan me with that large feather. Okay, we will. But here's the problem. That type of behavior modification, right? Like guilt, shame, coercion. It can get me short-term results with my kids, but it doesn't actually change the way they live. This is how we manage our sin. I'll do better next time. I'll try harder next time. I won't let that happen again. I can, I'll put up boundaries in my life to protect me from going down this path so we don't have that kind of fight anymore, so that I don't do this thing that I'm not supposed to do anymore. And those, again, those are good things. Those, you know, there's a lot of wisdom in that, but here's the problem. If that's where it ends, it's insufficient to change and transform you. What do we need? Well, here's what I want from my kids, okay, <laughs> like in a perfect world. Oh, Lord Jesus. I want my kids to look at me and go, man, my dad loves me. My dad cares about me. He's demonstrated that he loves my fa- my wife, <laughs> his wife, sorry. He loves our family. 
His desires are the best for me. So when he says I should do this or I shouldn't do that, I actually want, I want to obey because I know how good my dad is. Now, that's not reality, but that's the reality I'm in pursuit of, and we're not quite there yet. But this is how we actually change. We don't change by managing our sin. We don't change by feeling bad about our sin. Here's how we change. We change by recognizing that the person that we've sinned against is Jesus. The one that we've betrayed is Jesus with a kiss. And just as Jesus came to Peter, and three times said to Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Because Peter denied him three times as a way of saying, Peter, there's as much grace as you need for as much sin as you're going to commit. Jesus, he forgives betrayers. That's what he cries out on the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. But, but here's the problem. Judas didn't wait long enough to hear that. He couldn't bring himself to the place where he would come to Jesus. He couldn't imagine that Jesus would ever forgive him. And he died in his sin. Most people would say, and I agree, that Judas has spent, will spend eternity apart from Christ. We need to bring our sin to Jesus. It's not enough to feel bad. We need to practice repentance. We need to bring our sin to Jesus and recognize no matter what it is, he will forgive. He will extend grace. He will extend mercy. I need to keep going here. Second half of verse 4, the religious leaders respond to Judas. What is that to us? They replied. It's your responsibility. Here's kind of an irony here, right? You come to your pastor and he's like, not my problem. Right? These are the guys that like coaxed him into doing what he did in a sense. right? They were complicit in what he did. They're like, yeah, yeah, not our problem, your problem. Verse 5, and this is where it gets heavy. I spent a couple minutes on this. Verse 5, so Judas threw the money into the temple and he left. And then he went away and he hanged himself. So whatever was happening... Inside the heart of Judas, he was so filled with anguish over what he had done that he committed suicide. Now, I want to just say a couple of things about this before I dive into what I believe Matthew is getting at. First thing is this. Um, man, you can't, you can't make this stuff up, but this is deeply personal to me this week. This week, I got a call from a family member and somebody in my family attempted suicide. I mean, my, uh, one of my family members came home and found his spouse uh, hanging in the closet. Close family member. And, and I say all that not to seek sympathy. I mean, we're, we're not sure what's going to happen to this person. They're in the hospital. They're in an induced coma, hoping enough oxygen can get back to the brain that they will survive, but we, we don't know at this point. And I say that not to seek sympathy, but only to say this because I don't want anything I'm going to say to um, make you feel like I'm not sympathetic because I know that this is a very real issue in our world right now. Has been for a long time, but we're talking about it a lot more right now. Second thing I'll say is that this text, Matthew's intention in writing this, is not to actually deal with mental health. Right? Like, like Matthew's not writing here to, to make comments on mental health. I'm not going to preach on mental health, but, but here is, is what I'll say. Mental health is real. Like we, we need to talk about it. We, we have more information and education on it. There's a place to talk about medication and counseling, but that's not what this is for today. Okay, so so don't hear anything I'm going to say um, be a counter to that reality. I recognize that there, there are people that are struggling. And, it, and it's not, it's not going to, I don't want to spiritualize uh, all of this stuff, okay? Third thing I'll say, and this is where I'll get into what I believe Matthew is talking about. And I think this is an important comment to make. 
we are not merely biotic beings. Here's what I mean by that. We are, we are living in a time which is very strange, obviously, where, where I think we have in some way, whether it's the, the fruit of the Enlightenment or the fruit of Darwinian evolution, we have somehow reduced ourselves to biotic beings. And what I mean by that is we are a body. And our whole existence is, uh, you know, is trying to serve keeping the body going. If you just think about the way we've handled the, the pandemic, and I'm, and I'm not here to make comments on what I think is right or wrong. This, I, don't, I don't feel equipped to do that. But at most decisions, if not all decisions that we have made, for the most part, have been about preserving the body. Now, I think that's important. I think it's important to preserve the body. The body is made in the image and likeness of God. Life matters. I'm pro-life, so I'm pro-less people dying. But I do wonder if at times we have made decisions at the expense of, or at least not talking about nearly enough, the other aspects of what it means to be fully human. When Jesus talks about what it means to be fully human, he identifies that we are a body that has a mind and we are also spirit. And I think sometimes we forget that. I think even as believers in Jesus, we forget that. That when we sin, when we betray Jesus like Judas betrayed Jesus, it is not merely a physical act. There is more to us than just the physicality, the physical reality. That when we sin, we actually sin against our soul. And I believe what Matthew is trying to articulate for us, the picture he is trying to paint for us, is not, not a picture of mental health, but what he is trying to show us is that if we are not careful, if we do not put to death the deeds of the flesh. If we do not practice repentance as Peter practiced repentance and all we experience is remorse and worldly sorrow, here is what is going to happen to us. There will be a stain on our soul that we will long to have removed. And we will go to the temple and we will throw back the 30 pieces of silver and we will run away in anguish and we will find ourselves in a place where we do not know what to do with our sin. And we may not hang ourselves physically, but spiritually we will die. Judas could not imagine a Jesus who had enough grace to forgive him. And that haunted him. I am in no way uh, an expert in Shakespearean literature. Uh, but as I was preparing uh, for today, I came across uh, a little quib about um, a play that Shakespeare wrote, Macbeth. And in that quib, the, the author that was writing what I was reading attributed uh, this story of Judas as one of the inspirations for Shakespeare writing the play Macbeth. And, I don't know how well you know the story. I don't know it at all. I slept through English class all through high school. C's get degrees. Here we are. Um, kids, if you're watching online, children, that's, uh, dad didn't say that, all right? Um, <laughs> my oldest is in college. He's like, amen, dad, amen. Um, but the story is uh, Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, they desire power, right? They, they want power. They're willing to do whatever it takes to get power. And so they end up committing a murder. They, they murder King Duncan. They they end up, you know, in power. But, but here's the point I want to get to is that they get so overwhelmed with guilt over what they've done. Lady Macbeth in particular, so overwhelmed with guilt at what she's done. She starts to have like exactly what Judas has, this sense of anguish over, over what she's done. She wakes up in the middle of the night and she has these night terrors. She actually ends up uh, hiring a doctor who's basically like a psychologist to come in and observe her while she's sleeping. And there's this scene in, in um, Act 5, Scene 1, where, where she wakes up in the middle of the night and She's, you know, imagining that she has blood all over her hands from what she's done. And she runs to the wash basin to try and cleanse her hands of this blood. And no matter how hard she scrubs, no matter how hard she tries, there's this spot that she just 
cannot get out. I want to read a portion of what she cries out. She says this in her anguish. She says, come out, damned spot. Out, I command you. One, two. Okay, it's time to do it now. Hell is murky. Nonsense, my Lord, nonsense. You are a soldier, and yet we are afraid. Why should we be scared when no one can lay the guilt upon us? I want you to notice that line, right? They got away with their crime. Nobody knew. And yet she's filled with anguish. But who would have thought the old man would have had so much blood in him? What will my hands never be clean? So everything in her wants to be free from this guilt. But she just can't do it. And in the play, what does she do? She goes off stage and we're led to believe that she commits suicide just as Judas does. Friends, Judas could not imagine a Jesus who had enough forgiveness to offer him what he needed. And the only out he could imagine was to take his own life. But don't forget Peter last week, right? Three times he denies, three times Jesus forgives. Peter, I have exactly the amount of forgiveness that you need. I promise you, if Peter had denied Jesus four times, four times, Jesus would have said, do you love me, Peter? Some of you need forgiveness. You need it. You're holding on so tight. You're holding on so tight to your brokenness. You're holding on so tight to your sin. You're not repenting. You've given Satan a foothold. He's having a field day. It's destroying your life. It's destroying your marriage. It's destroying your relationship with your kids. It's destroying a friendship. It's destroying your soul. You might not find a tree and hang yourself physically, but spiritually you are dying a thousand deaths every day. Friends, don't believe the lie that Judas believed that says there's not enough forgiveness in Jesus. If there's anything we've learned about Jesus through this whole 122-week journey thus far through the Gospel of Matthew, it is that you cannot out the grace of Jesus. Amen? So why not bring it to him today? Why not free yourself of the burden today? Why not, instead of feeling remorse, practice repentance? Instead of trying to do it in your own strength, in your own power, be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and put to to death the misdeeds of the flesh and bring your sin to Jesus, friend. Look him in the face as he cries out over your sin. It is forgiven. You are made new. Go now and sin no more. And when you sin again tomorrow, come back to him. And again and again and again. Amen? I'm going to invite the band to come up. As they come up, I want to pray for us. Lord Jesus, I just sense that man, there's some hearts in this room that need to look you in the face eyeball to eyeball sense there, there's a little bit of Judas in all of us where we, we I know he'll forgive this part but what about this part I know that this sin is one that I can confess this sin is one that I can bring to Jesus, but I'm not sure about this one. I have shame. I have guilt. I don't want anyone to know. I'll just hide it. I'll just hide it. Friends, it's a lie from the pit of hell that you have to hide. the opposite of what Jesus wants to do. He wants to call you into the light. He wants to bring you to this moment where you're just bare in front of him. And then he wants to, like he actually wants to. In the same way Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss, he wants to, he wants you to experience and receive forgiveness with a kiss. An embrace from him.
to come to him.